I want to welcome you to the Pro Mindset Podcast. The Pro Mindset Podcast is all about diving into the headspace that results in championship performance. High performing athletes, winners, have this mental flow and have a positive headspace for their performances and success. Join me, Craig Doman, sports attorney and NFL agent, on this podcast. I will interview pro athletes, college athletes, football coaches, and sports personalities. Together, we can discover how you can get in the flow and have your own pro mindset. So today on Pro Mindset, I have a special guest, Mike Ackerley. Coach Ackerley was, believe it or not, my position coach many, many years ago at the University of Kansas. So we come in full circle. He used to tell me what to do, uh, boss me around on the field, and now I'm I'm in charge of this interview, Coach. So I want to thank you for being on. (laughs) Okay. Well, thanks for having me. Looking forward to it. You coached in college football for around 20, 21 years. And then how many years were you in the NFL as a personnel guy, whether it was in college scouting, an area scout, a director of college scouting, or a pro personnel guy? I was in the NFL for about 23 years, eight plus years with Tampa as an area scout, and I did the West Coast. And then uh, I left. Uh, I didn't need. I didn't have to leave Tampa, but it was one of those deals where I got an opportunity to go to the Rams and be the director of pro scouting. Unfortunately, that only lasted for a year, but I got an opportunity to go to the Titans and be the director of college scouting. Again, through my connections with Rich Need and a couple of other people that I knew there, which uh, was a good opportunity for me. It was a little better opportunity uh, maybe than the Rams. And so I ended up making that switch and going to the Titans and spending nine years at the Titans. So, you know, I was able to make some positive moves. Uh, And then, of course, they made a change at the Titans. and, And a lot of times when they make changes, uh, it didn't affect personnel as much, but uh, they had made a change at the Titan, Titans at the general manager. Floyd Reese left, and, and they brought in another general manager. And, and so, he, you know, those guys like to bring in their own people. So I felt it was time for me to make a move. It just so happens that I, I knew people at the Texans, and, and they happened to have an opening for the West Coast. And it was an opportunity for me to get back out west where I'm from and uh, scout an area that I'm very familiar with and know a lot of people. And and that worked out really well for me. And of course, and then, you know, I was to the age where I could retire. And so that's what I ended up doing later on. But, but anyway, that was kind of the, the trail right there. So. Okay. Coach, so 23 years in the NFL right. on the personnel side, regardless whether it's college or pro. Right. As everybody knows, coaches coach and front offices evaluate. And when you look at the most important player supply chain for the NFL is the NFL draft. Right. And you're out there as an area area scout. I mean, you're a road warrior or you're a director of college scouting. You're managing the draft board and collecting and validating evaluations from everybody that, that works with you all over the country. Right. What's the biggest difference between the evaluator, the scout mindset, and the coach mindset? And the reason why I ask you this is because sometimes the front offices will, you know, advocate for a guy going in the first or second round, and he never pans out. The coaches don't like him. They give up on him. They don't trust him. You know, he's not a hard worker. Whatever his Achilles heel is, there's also times where guys are an afterthought they get signed after the draft as undrafted free agents and the coaches fall in love with them and they end up playing for 10 plus years in the league. What's right. the difference between the evaluator mindset and the coach mindset in terms of handling and evaluating players? Yeah, that, that's a, that's a good question, Craig. And when I first got into scouting at Tampa Bay, I was hired by, well, Jerry Angelo was my connection there. Jerry Angelo was the director of player personnel for Tampa. Jerry and I were graduate assistants together at Colorado State. And when I first got to Tampa, one of the things they started drilling in my head was, hey, you need to not look at players as from a coach's perspective. You need to look at at it from a personnel's perspective. And 
it took me a while for that to sink in and uh, really understand what they were talking about because the more I was around it and the more experience I got, I saw that there was a connection, But you and you really can't divorce yourself from the coaching part of it. And I think it's important that a guy that has a coach's background, I think, is going to be a better scout because he has a better understanding of what the players are going through, what what's expected of them at different positions. If a guy hasn't been coaching, then he he may not have that same awareness. He may have been a player, you know, he may know his position pretty well, but when you're a scout, you're in every team I worked for, I scouted every position. In other words, when you go out on the road and you go to a school, you're evaluating offensive linemen, defensive linemen, so on and so forth. So if you have a coaching background, I think you're just more aware of what the nuances are of each position. I didn't fall in that trap of where forget everything you know as a coach because now you've got to evaluate the player, the athletic ability, blah, blah, blah. Well, heck, that's the same thing you're doing when you're recruiting. Uh, scouting is not a whole lot different when recruiting. Now, when I came up in college coaching, the coaches were a lot more involved in evaluating the players in their area, right? How is that different than scouting? It's not any different. Nowadays, these colleges, they have um, separate scouting departments, for example, and or recruiting departments, and they have they have people who are evaluating the players, and when the season's over, they give a list. You're recruiting California. Here's your players you're going to go recruit. They're already evaluated for you. I don't necessarily agree with that, but that's that's the way it's gone. Let me interject here. Okay. I want you to take the player's helmet off, and I want you to do brain surgery okay. on <laughs> players that you've either evaluated okay. and they didn't turn out like you anticipated or guys that you didn't even give a chance to as an evaluator, and they ended up being maybe a superstar or pro bowler or something of that right. nature. And right. my question is, maybe you name a couple of those guys, the Rams or the Bucks or whatever, and okay. what was the difference between that guy than everybody else that was in his same category? Because you, you and I both know what happens after the draft is, you know, anybody not on your draft board – that didn't get drafted, it's at a position where you want to add a couple guys, you go after those guys. Right. And then there's some guys that you just put on your free agent board that you had no intentions of drafting, but you'd like to have them in camp to see what they can do. Right. But you don't have any expectations, and you're not giving them any money. What's the common denominator of the players that you've seen over the years that have outperformed their skill set, outperformed their grade, their draft grade, Right. And why did it happen? Do you even have an idea about was it because they worked their ass off? Is it because they were coachable? Is it because they, they, you underestimated their physical abilities? What, was the, what were the reasons? Well, the first thing that I would say, and when I went into school and I'm evaluating the guys that are on the list and, and evaluating the players that the coaches recommend, the very first thing that I got in the back of my mind when I watched this kid is, is he a football player? Okay. Now, what does that mean? Well, at his position, does he play that position the way it's supposed to be played? If he's an offensive lineman, does he do the things that you want an offensive lineman to do? Okay. If he's a defensive back, is he a football player? Does he react? Does he do the things that you're looking for at that, at that position? And I call that being a football player. There are some things that you just can't coach. If the kid doesn't doesn't have that instinct as a football player, then I'm not going to say he can't make it, but it's going to be a lot tougher for him because there is an instinctive side to being a football player. Now, then all the other things by position come in. You know, I mean, uh, does he have the the athletic ability? Does he have what you're looking for in your offensive lineman? And this is where I think there has to be a connect. There has to be, and, and I've always believed this, and I, and I can't say that it's true uh, throughout the league, but there has to be a connect between your personnel department and your coaching staff. If there's no connect there, then it, there's going to be a struggle. Now, I'm going to give you an example of a player, and this player 
came in the league. He was a third. He was a third round pick. Okay, his name is John Lynch. And it was with, when I was with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Sam White was the head coach. And the way we did things back then was we sat down with the coaches before they went on the road, and and we went over the list of players, and we looked at certain players that we were interested in with the coaches. Well, this particular player, I don't. I'm sure you remember John Lynch, and, and I'm sure a lot of people still do. And he's a general manager in the league right now. But anyway, John was a safety at Stanford. We're looking at tape, and Floyd Peters is the is the defensive coordinator. And John Lynch is, is all over the field. He's playing strong safety. He's playing free safety. He's making plays all over the field. He's a hitter. He's tough. You can tell he loves to play football. He's smart. He knows where to line up. He gets other people lined up. I mean, he was the he was the quarterback in the secondary for Stanford, and he's making all these plays. And uh, I mean, our defensive coaches, our secondary coach, and our defensive coordinator are going, "Hey, we got to have this guy. What's it going to take to get this guy?" And uh, you know, we said, "Well, he's a baseball player. Uh, you know, he may decide to go baseball. He's probably a, a third round pick. You know, third or fourth round pick." And the coach says, oh, there's no way. This guy's going in the first round. And, okay, hold uh, on, coach. Hold on, okay, coach. Okay. Okay. Okay, so I like this, and I want to I wanna know why in the heck a guy like John Lynch, who was a perennial pro bowler, GM now, and had the mental makeup of a superstar, even at Stanford when he was all over the field. Right. Why in the heck do you say he's only at the what, – what, what, I'm going to I'm going to tell you. I'm going to I want to know you. why in the hell he's a third rounder. I'm going to tell you right now. He went to the combine. Okay, now I had been out in Stanford. Stanford was my area. The West Coast was my area when I was at Tampa Bay, and and I evaluated uh, John and I gave him a third round grade. Every, and we had our cross check uh, guy looked at him and he gave him a he gave him a third round grade. And the reason we gave him a third round grade was uh, we felt that, and, and you have to look at a lot of tape to see this type of stuff. There were times uh, John would get beat deep, so on and so forth, uh, or it looked looked to be a, a step slow. Okay, so we we felt like speed was going to be a concern. Okay, and then the other concern was that he was a baseball player and that he might go baseball. And, and now if we mess around and take a guy too high, uh, you waste a draft pick on a guy that, that's not going to be around. So so those are Hold concerns. on a second. Hold on. Hold okay, on. here so we go. Right, now, go. Okay. right now, all you've told me is on I'm, a couple plays, he showed like he might get beat. Okay, well, I'm getting okay. there. Okay. <laughs> he, goes to, he goes to the combine. So we're all, sit, we're all sitting there, you know, all the – all the uh, the coaches for the positions and so forth. You know how the combine works, okay? And so the, we're kind of sitting in a little group there, and here comes John Lynch. He's going to run his 40, you know? So the coaches are saying, well, what do you think he's going to run? What do you think he's going to run? And I'm saying, well, I'm hoping he runs 4-6. <laughs> well, the best time he ran, and I remember this like it was yesterday, even though it wasn't, he ran a 4-7-3. That was his best time at the – at the combine, four seven three. Well, now our coaches are just well. He can't play. He can't play. He's not fast enough. There's no way he can play in the NFL at four seven three. Uh, you know, blah blah blah. But now the scouts and me, particularly, I I love the kid. Okay, and I said, hey, this guy can play. I don't care what he runs. You know, I always felt that way. One of the things you learn in scouting is you have to gra- you have to put the grade on the guy. When you're sitting there in the draft room on draft day and all the information's in and everything's on the board, you're not going to put a guy that runs a 473 in the first round as a safety. You're not going to do that. You just don't you don't do that. At least that's the way we did at Tampa. Uh, that was our mentality at Tampa Bay. This everything when you put everything together, it all has to come out if you're going to put him in the first round, everything has to come out that he's a first rounder and 473 in the in the secondary is not a first rounder. Hey, coach. Uh, what? Go ahead. Okay. I, okay. I get it. I get it. You want okay. speed. Right. And secondary safeties are obviously speed is the dream. You don't want slow guys back there. Right. But how do you factor in reaction time and the ability to process the play and anticipate what's going to happen 
read combo routes and see blocking right. structures and be able to defeat those things. And those and are the all thing that, right. the thing those that are, drives me crazy is that everybody looks at a number, right. 450, 432. How many dudes over the year, I want to get back to John, but how many dudes over the years have run like 42, 43? Not very many. But most of them don't turn out to be anybody. Right. <laughs> they go really no, fast you're, the, you're, wrong, you're, the wrong you're direction. Right. Okay, so now John how Lynn. Fast, one, John, one quick thing before we go back to John Lynn. Okay. How, okay. Fast, how fast was Anquan Bolden at his combine? <laughs> well, see, there's, there's, I mean, there's another guy. Okay. There's an offensive lineman that run faster than him. Right. And here's, remember what I said right at the beginning? Is he a football player? If he's a football player, then you want him on your team. And that's, a, that's, that's Anquan Bolden. That's Jerry Rice. That's those kind of guys that are marginal speed-wise, but they've got that, whatever you want to call it, that it factor, and I say football player. And, and John Lynch was a football player, and don't, and don't get me wrong. We wanted John Lynch in the worst way. I wanted John Lynch in the worst way. And we did everything we could. I can't tell you the number of times that I went out after the combine and time John Lynch. I went back up to Stanford two other times between the combine and the draft to specifically individual workout with John Lynch and time in the 40. The best, the best time I ever got him on grass was 475. The bottom line is the guy's Coach, a football player. You yes. were freaking, you had a slow thumb. I know. You, okay. You, you well, had that, a slow finger, man. <laughs> that's what I was accused of. <laughs> but well, but here's the thing, anyway, here's the, anyway, here's the thing, coach, here's the thing that you're pointing out. Right. The NFL has these factors that they consider prior to the draft to give a guy a draft grade. Right. But the draft grade really is only for the draft. We right. really don't know what's going to the, the predictors for what's going to happen after that are very difficult. That's why they're called human beings. <laughs> you know That's what right. I mean? Yeah. Really, and you talk about guys that are busts, uh, that, got, that get drafted in the first round, so on and so forth. I haven't been on a staff yet that doesn't work their tails off trying to eliminate that from happening because nobody wants to take a high pick and have him, have him be a bust. And don't well, get coach, me wrong. I coach, mean, we, 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 we've, we've had some. We've had some. So, Coach. Yes. Yes. Go ahead. All right. You guys aren't very good at it because 50% of the first rounders bust damn near every year. You yeah. Know, you, and, you wait well, about, I, ha wait about I have an years. opinion. I have an opinion on that. <laughs> okay. Well, I want to hear that too. But, like, you know, if you, if you, you can't judge the draft class the day after. You can't even do it a year later. But three to four years later, you can evaluate a draft class. Right. And half the time, three to four years later, the first rounders did not meet expectations. Yeah. Right. So why? Why does that happen? Well, like I said, human beings. And it's not an exact science. I mean, there's a lot of factors involved in the evaluation on tape and seeing kids play in uh, in person is just one uh, one part of it. I mean, when I'd go to a game and watch a kid in person, I watched him as much on the sideline and interacting with his teammates as much as I did. I really wasn't there evaluating what kind of player he was on the field because I'm doing that on tape. What I'm looking at is what kind of teammate is he? What is How is he reacting to when something bad happens on the field? What happens when he goes, does he take his helmet off and throw it in the bench? Well, you know, those are all things to me that are important. Do you want that kind of kid on your team? Well, no, you, no, you really don't. You want a guy that's gonna gonna fight to the very end. You're you're looking for the guy that's gonna give you everything he has, regardless of the score, and he's gonna be a good teammate regardless of the score. And that's it. Doesn't just appear. You have to study guys a lot. You have to ask a lot of questions. And to be quite honest with you, a lot of times coaches, uh, college coaches, trainers, blah blah blah, they aren't honest with you. Uh, sometimes. Uh, coach, if you were a college coach for 21 uh, years. Exactly. And I told what? guys, I told I was a college coach for longer than that, actually. But anyway, I told, I told guys the straight scoop. I mean, 
either you want this guy or you don't want this guy. I mean, uh, what kind of worker is he, blah, blah, blah. You know, I mean, because I, you have to deal with those guys all the time. And if you get a reputation as, as being a guy that doesn't uh, doesn't tell the truth or or shades uh, or hides stuff, then that's not a reputation. That's not the kind of reputation you want. Now, there's guys out there that don't care about that, and they're trying to sell their players, and that and that's fine. I can honestly say that I wasn't that way. So I mean, I would. Well, your relationships, I, I, your relationships are critical as a scout because you got to no, know no doubt whether no half doubt. the half the stuff the coach is telling you is BS. Or one hundred percent of it's accurate. You got to, yeah. and you find that out over time, and you start, you know, you almost start evaluating the well, college coaches that you go talk to on how accurate they are are in previous year guys. Well, to, uh, well, let me give you an example. Ryan Leaf, West Coast guy, Washington State. I I knew a lot of those coaches up there. You can't believe what they said about Ryan Leaf. That that ultimately was not true. Well, ultimately, it proved out that, it, that, that uh, they were obviously, this is one of those deals when scouts would go in there. This is one of the few times when the only coach on the staff that talked about Ryan Leaf was the head coach. So if you didn't have a personal connect with somebody else on that staff, the only information that you were going to get as far as what kind of kid he was was from the head coach. Well, fortunately, I knew other guys, so I was able to get, up, you know, what I thought was other information because I would not take Ryan Leaf. I mean, if, if it were up to me based on, on the information that I found out, I wouldn't have drafted him where he got drafted. So, obviously, either his ability or perceived ability by the team that took him overrode whatever they found out or they bought or they drank the Kool-Aid, let's put it that way. Okay. So they did. So, they did. So, so my point my point is is that's gonna you know, those are the things you have to kinda guard against and those are the things that you really you, you don't have a lot of control over uh, a lot of times. You have to do your work, you have to dig. If you have a question about a guy, if if you don't try to dig out what's actually there, if you have a question, then you're gonna make a mistake. And the only thing you can do is try and try and try as you might uh, to not have it happen. And obviously, nobody wants to make a mistake on a first round or be well, even even the uh, first three rounds because you're still paying those you're still giving those guys a lot of money. You really don't want to make those kind of mistakes. But but they're, unfortunately, they're going to happen. Now, every staff I worked with, uh, I mean, we worked our tail off to try to guard against it. But the the bottom line is in every room in all, in all thir- in all thirty two teams in every in every draft room, there's one person that makes the final decision. And I've jumped up and down on the table for guys, and it didn't go my way. And I've jumped up and down on the table for guys, and it went my way. So that's just that's just the way it is. And the bottom line is the guy that's the final decision maker. You better hope that he's done his work, or at least he's bought into the work that you've done. Let's put it that way. Every team I've worked for, every general manager, uh, every player personnel director that I've been associated with, they put the time in on the top guys. Now, do they put the time in with the with the background and stuff? No, that's your job as a scout to go out and get and dig and get that information. And if you give them bad information, it's going to come back on you. That's another reason not to give them bad information if you want to keep your job. So. But, uh, okay, Coach, I've got an idea that just kind of popped in my head. Okay. Kind of stealing, stealing a, a concept from golf. Okay, okay. And we, we call it the handicap. Right, I know and, what it is. Mine's right, real high. Like, mine's real mine's high. Real high. <laughs> mine's higher than yours, I'm guessing. <laughs> but it's like it's a way to accurately describe a player's game, his abilities. Okay. And I, and I think we should have a handicapped 40 time. And what I mean by that is if a guy, let's say he runs a 4.35, but his play speed is not 4.35. Right. His reactions are not that way. He doesn't have that. Let's say he's a receiver, and he he can't beat guys that run 4.6, but he runs a 4.35. Right. And I've seen seen guys like that. Yeah. And then you got guys on defense that run 4.9s, 
but they just make plays. Well, John now, Lynch. In, John Lynch is four seven three, and he made. You know, I mean, he's probably going to go in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he he should. Yeah, he so should. Here, You're right. So so here's the deal. He did not play a four seven three because no, he knew he what not. was going to happen. He he read it. He was already a step or two in the direction of the play before somebody that might run a four five zero even knew what the hell was going on in the play. Yep, I agree. So let's say he really did run a 4.7, mm-hmm. okay? The thing that the 40 time at the Combine and the Pro Days and private workouts don't tell scouts is what if he's getting chased or what if he is chasing somebody? Mm-hmm. That's another part of the handicap. Right. It, you know, I guarantee you that if you put John Lynch and made him race somebody else from his draft class at Stanford side by side and didn't even time the other guy. Yeah. He ran faster than four seven three. Probably true. <laughs> yeah. Because the, now he's competing. He's not just running. He's not right. track anymore. Right. So I really think the only time in football where pure speed matters is in cover zero, and you got a receiver that can beat a DB, just flat out beat him, and he can actually adjust the ball. He's got hands. All that he can track the ball. All that stuff. And the other time is maybe on punts. You know, when you're the gunner. And you're trying to pin him down inside the 10, and the, the return guy's faking like he's catching the ball, and the ball's headed towards the end zone, and pure speed might show up right there. Yeah, because that's straight line. Most of that is straight line stuff. And so you're running from point A to point B, and you're breaking down and coming under control and, and trying to keep the ball out of the end zone, for example, if it's a punt cover guy. If you're a wide receiver and you're running a, you're in there for your speed alone, uh, you're going to run the streak or the go pattern or straight down the field and hope like hell you catch it or hope like hell the quarterback can throw it uh, so you so you have an opportunity to catch it. I mean, years and years ago, I, I guess before you, I mean, I don't know, uh, Bob Hayes. Remember somebody tried to make a football player out of Bob Hayes? Do you remember who he was? Do you know who yep. he is? Yep. I mean, yeah, 100 meter guy in the Olympics, and they try as they might. They tried to make a race, and he made some catches, and he did okay. But he was never, you know, he was the fastest. He was the fastest man in the world, right? Yeah, he he was the fastest man in the world. He was the best football player in the world. No, he was not because, but he had the straight line speed. So, so they put him out there, and and uh, do you think that defensive back was nervous when he had to line up on Bob Hayes? Uh, yeah, but you know what? The smart ones give him a little bit more cushion. <laughs> well, right? yeah, or, or the smart coaches played zone and just had, got deep and, and put a safety over the top and not worried about it. But Bingo. Neutralize the speed. So here's right. what I'm going to say about safety. That is an umbrella position on defense where speed does matter. And once you recognize the play, and let's say you're, you're reading run the pass, and you've got to help one of your buddies over the top on a post route or something, right. and you've got to get on your horse and get there. Pure speed matters. Yes. It matters right there. But right. if it takes you a little bit longer to figure out and diagnose the play. Doesn't matter how I, fast you are. <laughs> doesn't matter. Right. And if you are quick at diagnosing it, you really should handicap their 40s to say, hey, you know what, we're going we're gonna to give him a, a, an adjusted 40 time. We're going to say, right. hey, man, he, he, he really plays like a 4-4-9 four, four, guy. Don't get me wrong. If you put him on a guy that runs a 4-3, he's going to lose. But we're never and, going to put him in that situation. And, and that, was, that was my thing about, it, uh, about, about John Lynch. And one of the things I, uh, I mentioned earlier, as soon as, he, as soon as he posted that four, I mean, I can remember this like it was yesterday. We're at the Combine, and he posted that 4-7-3 as his fastest time. Our defensive coaches – who wanted to, wanted to take him in the first round and wanted uh, couldn't believe how good he was before we got there. As soon as he ran that four three, they didn't want to have anything to do with him. And and it and believe it or not, when he was sitting there in the third round, okay, believe it or not, we had to fight at Tampa Bay to take him. We had to we had to fight to take him, even though our general manager Rich McKay he wanted him. He wanted him, but the coaches were so adamant. And finally we convinced Rich that, hey, we need to take this guy. He plays better than that 4-7-3. 
we can't ignore this kid based on the 40 speed. And so we went against our coaches. Well, what happened? The guy gets in training camp, and the coaches can't believe it. This is the greatest guy since sliced bread. I mean, they they were they were so ecstatic that we got him before before we got him. Floyd Peters actually said this. He said he won't make it through the first practice. We'll cut him after the first practice. <laughs> two, two days later, he's in our he's in our and, and we're all there during training camp. And you know we, we did uh, we did a lot of in service stuff in training camp as scouts getting ready for the season. And he came in and he says. Damn, this kid's really good. I'm glad you guys didn't cut him. I'm glad you got, you know, I mean, he's, he can't say enough good things about the kid, you know, but anyway, that's just one example that happens, you know, that happens all across the league. There's guys like that. Some of those guys are those free agent guys. And, okay, Mike. Yeah. So you talked about probably the overriding factor in evaluating college players getting ready for the draft. Yes. The measurables are important. The 40 is important. Probably more I don't, important I don't, than it should uh, be. Let me interrupt you right there. I don't think the 40, if it were me, I would stop running the 40 tomorrow. I, w- I wouldn't time these guys in the 40 yard dash personally, but I think it's the worst thing we do because there is so much emphasis on that. That's what a lot of these kids, that's all they work on is trying to run a fast 40 because they've been conditioned. And of course, a lot of, a lot of your younger scouts nowadays. They've been, con- everybody's been conditioned that the 40, the 40, the 40, that's the most important thing. And I don't believe it is myself. I think the football player is the most important thing. And if you don't, if you don't find football players, it doesn't matter how fast they are. Yeah, I sorry. think there's two, two modifications that would be reasonable to make on the, on the 40 yard dash. One is to have them wear full pads and their football cleats. So that at least represents what they're doing. Because I've never seen an NFL game in my life or college <laughs> yeah. where they didn't wear that stuff. Yeah, I mean, you, they won't yeah, let you, I... they won't let you like, they won't let you on the field. If you don't have your helmet. So, you know, put all that pads, put our pants on. You I'm know, with yeah, you. Some, somebody will come up with the no weight pads. You know, it'll be like you know the shoulder pads will be so light. I don't care. They're at least yeah. wearing something. And then the second thing I would do is create a reactionary start. Instead of the scout starting the clock when the player goes, because some of these guys take five minutes to get in the perfect position no doubt. before they even take off, right? Right. Um, I'm, you I'm, with, I'm with you 100%. You're, you're, you, you don't have to convince me. I, like I said, I'd knock it out tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, so do something where they have to react to something right. so that that's factored into their – ability, their speed, that type of thing. Right. So, but let's get back to, to be able to identify the players that are football players compared to the guys that just have the measurables that fit in the box, that fit the profile. Right. Besides being in the right place at the right time, making plays, what is the next most important thing in your mind to evaluate a, a college kid before he goes into the draft? Well, you know, I think. After I, game tape, after game tape, what's the next most important thing? Oh, not not game tape. Not game well, tape, or I, yeah. or some subset of that. I'm not going to yeah. limit what you say. You you tell me what well, you say. Well, well, I would want to find out, and and what I always tried to find out is what kind of off season uh, football player is this guy? What what does he do? Does he just show up in the weight room from nine to ten when you tell him to be there, or is he the is he the guy that's going to put in the extra time? Is he the guy? That's gonna that wants to be as good of football player at his position that he can be. Where this is more critical than any other position, in my opinion, are the linemen. If if those linemen aren't willing, because these guys are the grunts. These guys, and I'm talking more specifically probably about offensive linemen, because the defensive linemen have have become a little different breed of cat. But but in general, if a lineman isn't willing to put in all that time in the dungeon, lifting weights and doing doing the things that they need to do to be good at their position, then they're going to struggle at the next level. So I'm looking for linemen that not only are, are smart and can learn learn the offense and so on and so forth, but, but that are guys that don't care about getting their knuckles dirty, don't care what their uniform looks like, 
they're snot coming out of their nose and they're sweating all the time and and they're doing everything they can to get better at knocking the hell out of the guy across from them. If an offensive lineman doesn't have that mentality, then your quarterback is going to be sacked too many times. I'm sorry. That's just the way it is. And I see, I still see it every Sunday, every time. And I see it in college too. You want to know why, you want to know why Alabama every year is as good as they're, they are. Go watch them practice. Go watch what the head coach does during practice to get every ounce out of those guys that he can. And, and he gets it out of them in practice. Those are the kind of guys you want. So those, those are the kind of things that, that you got to try to find out. You got to, you got to get down there with that strength coach and hey, tell me what kind. And I know sometimes they don't tell you the straight scoop, but if you, if you can, you got to, you got to try to find out if this guy is going to put in the time off the field to be the kind of player that he needs to be. If you're a prima donna out there at wide receiver and maybe the corners, maybe you, you know, you, you can kind of bypass that that weight room every once in a while. But really the bottom line is you want the same kind of guy in those positions. But that's what that's what I try to dig out. What what is this kind of guy gonna do when he doesn't have a football uniform on? And that and those are the guys I want to gravitate to and those are the guys I want to build the program with. Well, Coach, isn't it fair to say, and I, and I hate to even say this, but I know it's true, that there's always exceptions to what you just said. There's some guys that are blessed with so much ability that they can show up to practice hungover. They can do all the wrong things. They can right. loaf through weight, the weight training program, but yet they're better than everybody else on Sundays or Saturdays. Right. And you don't want those guys – you don't want very many of those guys – or any at all, if you can, if you can help it, mm-hmm. but because talent is so important, that's why a lot of teams get in trouble because they keep too many of those guys on the roster. And then all the other guys on the team are like, well, hell, if he's not working hard, why should I work hard? Well, those players, yeah. that group of players needs to work hard. They need to be dialed in off in the off season because then they're not going to be any good. Yeah. Well, the thing I would say to that is, and again, there, there's there's going to be exceptions to everything, you know, everything we throw out there. But the guy I'm looking around, looking for is going to be there 9, 10, 11 years from now. The guy that doesn't want to do that is not going to be there. He might be there five years from now, but he's not going to be there 10 years from now. Trust me on that one. Uh, you know, I mean, hell, there's guy. I mean, Vince Young. How long did Vince Young stay in the league? Not very long. That's right. I mean, and, okay, he, so, and we and so we took him. We took him in the first round. I mean, we took him. Yeah, that's uh, that's I mean, coach. That's your fault. That's your fault. You were, I you agree. Were. I agree. I wouldn't okay. have. Uh, to be honest with you, I mean, and I know somebody will say, "Well, it's easy to look to look backwards and and say that." I said I wasn't a Vince Young, a Vince Young fan. I'm, I'm sorry, I wasn't. Uh, but, uh, you know, again, it comes down to the guys making the decision. Is the guy talented? Hell, yes, he's talented. But w- where is the mental makeup? I mean, you saw it on the field. If you if you recall, I mean, uh, you, you saw pouting on the field. You, you saw some of that stuff on the field. You never saw that from Luck. You never saw that from Andrew Luck. You know, you don't see it. You don't see it from this quarterback that's playing for Clemson right now. My goodness gracious! I mean, the guy just, uh, you know, those guys don't do that kind of stuff. The winners don't do that. I'm sorry. Well, coach, I want to thank you very much for being on Pro Mindset today. Well, we thanks. Lively, for, thanks for having me. <laughs> we had a lively conversation about John Lynch and the whole draft process. I enjoyed it. It was great. Thank you for listening to this episode of Pro Mindset. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. You can follow us on our website, promindsetpodcast.com, or on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Pro Mindset Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you the next time.